of Americans leave prisons and jails every year, often with only the clothes on their backs. They move from spaces of confinement into a free society, but freedom remains elusive as long as they struggle to belong. What ex-prisoners need and want most are jobs. But it's not about putting them to work. It's about us. It's about how we can reimagine our communities so that people can get the second chances that they deserve. Unfortunately, most programs that are designed to rehabilitate ex-prisoners end up sending them down dead ends again and again. This is a ramp to nowhere. It's built for compliance, but it benefits no one. It symbolizes a much more serious problem, that we invest in solutions that don't work. For example, we mandate that felons participate in work-ready programs, but we do nothing to create more decent jobs or to improve the conditions of low-wage work. Or we have tax credits to hire felons that few use and even fewer benefit from. What's different about inclusive design? This curbless city is built to serve the needs of diverse people. It's makes it easier for people in wheelchairs. It makes it easier for people who are blind. It even helps this guy who's texting and walking. What a curbless city does is that it creates the openness that benefits everyone. When we continue to punish ex-prisoners long after they've served their sentences, Essentially, what we are doing is preventing them from walking and moving among us in our public spaces. But we can build different kinds of social architectures. We can create with purpose, we can make for belonging, and we can become architects of inclusion. In my research, I've studied the factors that keep ex-prisoners out of the labor market. And that research has found that there's discrimination. Many, if not most, employers consider that record as a badge of stigma. And it can be a pretext for racial exclusion. Now, I didn't want to ask more questions about why people discriminate, and a different kind of question. And the question that I had is, why do some employers hire people with criminal records? So I set out to interview a very distinctive sample of employers who did just that. Now, some may assume that the answer is easy. They do it for the money. All the employers that I interviewed knew about work opportunity tax credits. They didn't use them because they knew they were more trouble than they were worth. They are the ramps to nowhere. What made my employers distinctive is that they considered people with records as not that different as people without records. They knew when they hired any employer, employee that it created certain kinds of risks or liabilities. And they considered the kinds of problems that potential employees had, even serious ones like substance, uh, substance abuse, to be just as frequent among people who had never gone to jail. Now, when I talked to these employees, I learned two very important things. The first one is that these employers had a keen sense of interconnectedness. So when they met someone with a criminal record, they thought, that could be my friend, or that could be a relative. Or some of them were 
able to jump across wide gaps of class and social status and say, that could have been me, especially if they had grown up under circumstances. The second thing that I learned was that these employers already knew how to create spaces of belonging. They started this out by never treating people as a category. So they had, and they realized that they had the power to take someone who had never thought of themselves as anything else but a criminal and give them the opportunity to understand themselves as a productive, paid worker. They also knew that any relationship needed to begin with trust. And they gave that same kind of trust to the person with a criminal record that they would give to any other new employee. They also worked hard to create inclusion. Sometimes this was just by offering flexibility. So they thought, if I'm going to let one worker go to the doctor's appointment, it's really not that different if I'm going to let this guy with a record go off during the day to meet with his probation officer. They often did also little things that made enormous difference. For example, one employer thought it was nothing to swing by the jail and pick up a new employee from a work release program. When ex-prisoners leave jails, often they run into incredible obstacles. And one of them is just getting a driver's license reissued. So if someone's lucky enough to have a job, they're often taking the bus or walking to work. But if an employer offers an environment where relationships can develop, where friendships naturally form, then it doesn't take very long for that coworker to say, can I give you a ride home? Now, I don't want to glorify what these employers had to offer. These were low-paid, bad jobs. But they did something remarkable. Because they understood our common vulnerabilities, they were able to afford dignity and treat people equally. They also considered inclusion their social responsibility. So some of them even mentioned that they were motivated by mass incarceration, and they understood its impact on black and minority communities. So we could be, in a very similar way, architects of inclusion. We don't need special training as architects. What we need is to simply think about how we can create spaces where this kind of belonging can happen. So when I teach, I practice being an architect of inclusion. So for 10 years, I've been teaching a class inside prison made up of an equal number of college students and incarcerated students. It's based on a model developed by Lori Pompa at Temple University. So in this class, we create inclusion by design. It's a lot like that curbless city in that we create it through freedom of movement. So when we're together as a group, we're scattered, we frequently move into small, integrated groups. We get up to lead, perform, to express our opinion on one side of an issue or another. We also make our space feel less like a prison. So we're in the room, and the loudspeakers are blaring, head count now in progress. A dome ca camera is always watching us. Guards are walking in and out of the room as if it's a prison. But we make it our classroom. And we make this space feel so different that one inside student once told me, it feels like two and a half hours of freedom. It's also a classroom in which people don't put themselves into categories. 
And each group of students before the semester began never imagined being in the same room together. But it doesn't take them long to build relationships and develop that kind of interconnectedness. So most of my students can't say like my employer, I could have gone that way. But they are able to become like the coworker and say, can I give you a ride home? Now in this class, we talk about texts, political science texts on citizenship. But we engage in critical thinking when we move into dialogue about our diverse past that brought us here together. So in the context of talking about these readings, students grapple with what it means to be raised in a supported family versus experiencing the terrors of foster care. To have had the opportunity to be schooled where you learn versus being in schools where you're constantly disciplined. Or, at the moment, living in the luxury of a college campus versus experiencing the immediate pains of imprisonment. And, importantly, for some, they always have the prospect of that great job in front of them. And for others, they know once they get released, they're looking down a path of persistent unemployment. Now, I don't want to glorify what I can do in one semester. But a few of my inside students leave prison and get that undergraduate degree or start successful businesses. But the thing that happens, I think, to all of the inside students is that they are able to feel like they belong in this academic setting like their views are valued and respected. And for my Amherst students, it's also the case that many of them mention this was the first classroom they've ever been in where they felt like they could say something unpopular without being ostracized or judged. Now, when I moved from teaching in the prison to the college campus, it's a difficult transition. It's hard to create the same kind of belonging, the same kind of, of connection, and social architecture. So when I teach on campus, what I try to do is bring the communities and groups that are outside of the room into the room. So in my course called Work, we do this quite literally. We invite workers from across the campus who do service jobs into a session to have an academic discussion. I also ask my students to engage in role-playing exercises so that they can assume the roles of the people who are outside the room. So as they're discussing issues, they think about what it means to be that maintenance worker whose body is tired and injured, or the single mother who has to make the impossible choice between the responsibilities of their jobs and taking care of their children, or the disabled worker who's afraid to ask for an accommodation because of fear of being fired, and the ex-prisoner who is facing chronic unemployment. Now, it's hard for my students to do this in a serious and sustained way, but I do think what they come to realize through this assuming the role of others, is that these groups are made invisible in most academic discussions because of our social ac architecture. Now, I also ask my students to practice being architects of inclusion. So I give them assignments about creating spaces where groups who have been traditionally excluded can thrive. So one example is they design a workplace that has special accommodations for people with a range of disabilities or people who have experienced chronic unemployment. And when those students design those workplaces, I find that they do the same things as the employers I interviewed. They build in flexibility. They get rid of hostile aspects of the environment. 
They care about trust between the managers and the workers, and they end all surveillance. When I ask my students, would you rather work in your specially designed workplace, they all emphatically say yes. And I think the reason for that is, is because once we are given the opportunity to redesign our familiar places, it becomes so obvious that designing for the few benefits the many. So when I see my students apply such creativity and use such innovative sense of design, it gives me hope. Hope that we can build fewer ramps to nowhere and instead imagine communities that are defined by openness, freedom, and belonging.